Hi guys. Okay, so it's another historical story. This one is about, uh, well, let's just say they thought it might have been a bird or maybe a plane, but nope, it was just Superman. Only we're not talking about the DC comic character. We are talking about Christopher Reeve. Uh, I never really was a DC character lover. I'm more for Marvel. But Christopher Reeve had a way about him to make the Superman character in the movies really work. And there is so much more to this man than just Superman. He was born September... He was born September 25th in 1952. Uh, just, just one month and five days older than my mother. Uh, his full name, Christopher De Oliver, De Ollier, however he would have pronounced that, I have no idea. D, comma, Ollier, De Ollier, Reeve. Um, his, uh, let's see, his paternal grandfather was CEO of the Prudential Life Insurance. So that's pretty cool. In 59, when, um, in 1959, Christopher was enrolled in the Princeton Day School. It was a country day school. And later it merged with a girl's school to become a co-ed school named Princeton Day School. Not country school, but day school. Uh, it happened that his mom and dad had divorced. And so he, he and his brother rent with their mother. And she later married someone else. And his stepdad... Uh, got him enrolled in the in the Princeton Country School. Uh, by the time he was nine years old, he got to play uh, in a in a um, in an operetta that Yeoman of the Guard is an amateur version. Uh, he was very, very good in school. He excelled in uh, academically and athletic and on the stage. He was also on the honor roll. He played soccer, baseball, tennis, and hockey. Now, supposedly, like, he acted much older than he was because he wanted his dad's approval, his real dad's approval. So, he worked very hard on being more mature than he was. But when he was cast into the operetta, he found that he had a love for acting. And so, he more or less pursued it every chance he had. At the age of 15, he was also accepted as apprentice at the Williamstown Theater Festival in Massachusetts. The uh, other apprentices were college students, but because Christopher acted so mature, he fit in. How cool, huh? Um, it was from the start that people noticed that he had a very great acting talent. After one performance called A View from the Bridge, Olympia Dukakis said, Olympia Dukakis, she said, 
I am surprised. You have a lot of talent. Don't mess it up. Can you imagine that? Olympia Dukakis? She had to have been young then. She had to have been. Um, he wanted to pursue acting, but his mom and stepdad insisted that they that he attend college and graduate first. So he chose to go to Cornell. He had put in applications in several different colleges, and he was approved by every single one of them. But he chose to go to Cornell. Now hold on here, and I'll I'll read to you all of the uh, all of the colleges that he 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 graduated the day school in seventy, and he acted in plays in Booth Bay, Maine. He wanted to go to New York to find a career in theater, but of course his mom wanted him to go to college. So, he was accepted into Princeton University, which was in New Jersey. He was accepted at Columbia University, which was in New York. Brown University, which is in Providence, Rhode Island. Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, and Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburghville, Pennsylvania. Can you imagine that being so academically gifted that you are accepted in every college you apply to? Can you imagine that? Somebody, somebody that was involved in, in act in uh, plays and stuff, noticed him and wanted to sign him up. And Christopher was very tickled about that. But when he discovered that he hadn't finished college yet, he agreed with Christopher's mother that he needed to finish college. So he went to Juilliard to uh, do the performing arts and uh, there was the advanced acting class that he applied for and only two people were accepted into it. Christopher Reeve and Robin Williams. So a lot of times they were the only two in that particular class. One of the requirements was they had to learn many dialects. Now, any of you who don't know, Robin Williams was so talented with his voice. He could do any dialect, any, any mock, whatever. He could imitate voices and dialects, no problem. And sure enough, in the class for dialects, he passed it. No problem, man. He did it. Didn't have a single bit of trouble. Christopher Reeve had to work very hard to achieve it, though. He had to work hard to get the dialects down. Robin Williams had no problem. <laughs> they ended up becoming very, very good friends. Very good friends. Um, and later on, Robin Williams proved just what kind of a friend he was. You'll find out later on. In 75, he tried for the Broadway play A Matter of Gravity, where he met Katherine Hepburn. She cast him to play as her grandson. They became very good friends and corresponded often after they had finally parted ways, which she wanted Christopher Reeve to kind of hang around and be somewhat like her supporting actor. But eventually he just went on ahead and went another direction. And so um, 
but after that they corresponded a lot. They kept up with each other. As it happened, uh, Christopher Reeve, with him going into Juilliard, uh, Cornell considered that to be part of the academic major that he could could uh, be a, in a class of, and so um, he graduated. Um, and yeah, he graduated from Cornell. in 74 with a Bachelor of Art. Finally, in, um, in 1978, he got to do his first film. He played a small part as a junior submarine officer in Grey Lady Down. His very first film, Grey Lady Down. Um, and now, as it happened, it was also in 1978 he discovered that uh, he had been asked to audition for Superman. So the um, the casting director had took Christopher Reeve's face and resume and put it on top of the pile for auditions, and three times it was tossed aside. Nobody wanted to audition him, but after being persistent, they finally checked it out and called him in. So, um, okay, the film Superman was 1978, um, but in 77, he got to finally uh, do an audition with Richard Donner, who was the director, and uh, Elia Selkind, however you would pronounce his name, the producer. And um, after the audition, the next day, he got a 300-page script. They had accepted him as Superman. So... Uh, he had to fly for he had to fly to London for the screen test, and on the way he was actually told that Marlon Brando was going to be playing Jor-El, jor, -El. jor -El, Superman's dad. Um. So, it happens that Christopher Reeves stood at six foot four inches tall, so he was plenty tall enough, but he was still somewhat of a slender man for his for his height. And of course you would look at Superman as being muscular, right? So in order to be Superman, instead of having them put the muscles in the suit, he chose to do weightlifting. And so it happened that the um, champion weightlifter David Prowse, who also was the man in the suit of Darth Vader in the original Star Wars, oversaw Christopher Reeve's weightlifting regimen. How cool is that? <laughs> He would do running in the morning and do two hours of weight lifting and 90 minutes on the trampoline. In other words, get those muscular legs. And he also doubled his food intake and adopted a high protein diet. Now, the one thing that's really that's really funny is I guess he had kind of learned his lesson because when he was younger, when he was still doing the plays, he was like doing two performances at a time. He didn't have very much of a me time schedule, and so he was just uh, eating candy bars and drinking coffee. 
and he went to do one play, and Katherine Hepburn was there. I think it might have been the play that she had casted him as the grandson. Anyway, um, she was watching, and he, he said, run line, and then fainted. And she said, he's a fool. He doesn't eat enough meat. So I think he might have learned his lesson after that. <laughs> he, uh, the doctor told him to eat more well-balanced foods. And so, you know, he kind of hurt himself that way. But, you know, he was young and dumb. So intelligent, so good at acting, so good academically and athletically, but stupid enough not to realize that he needed to put down more protein and minerals if he was going to be that active, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, when it came time for him to finally do uh, Superman 4, uh, he didn't work out as much because uh, the year prior he had to have his appendix took out. So, apparently, he was still recovering from that. Now, he had uh, some, a, a condition in his scalp. And this, this is what's really strange to me because, you know, well, I'm not going to get ahead of the cart. Um, anyway, his hair sometimes would come out in, in piles. And so, like... The first two Superman, he dyed his hair black and he swooped it the right way to hide the patches of bald spots. Um, but in the other two, Superman 3 and Superman 4, he wore a rig. So apparently his hair had really come out during that time. Uh, and sometimes it wouldn't come out at all, is what it had described. Um, he wasn't really into Superman or comic books, but, um, let's see, he used to watch The Adventures of Superman with George Reeves. Now, there's no connection. I used to think that maybe there was a relationship there, but you have to realize George Reeves with, was with an S, R-E-E-V-E-S. Christopher Reeve, no S, just R-E-E-V-E. -E. So, no relationship. But I used to think there must have been somehow. But no. Um, he, he found that the role offered a suitable challenge because it was a dual role. Apparently, he enjoyed the thought of getting to play two characters. That was one, but at the same time was had to do two personalities, you know. And so, uh, he chose to, um, he, he said, there must be some difference stylistically between Clark and Superman. Otherwise, you just have a pair of glasses. So, he literally switched the attitude. And if you ever watch Superman, you notice that, like, in his... When he would be Clark Kent, he would be so naive, stumbling, you know, just innocent. And then as Superman, like, he was the man of that hour, you know. So he was very talented to be, be able to portray two different type characters. One person with dual personality, even though, of course, Superman had to be in disguise like that. Now, if you had never watched the Superman TV series with George Reeve, uh, with George Reeves, rather, S, um, when he played Clark Kent, he was still intelligent. He wasn't, he wasn't a bumbling fool. He wasn't uh, naive and all that. He still acted like he knew something, you know. He wasn't like, Bleh, you know, just a, uh, well, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but Christopher Reeve added a new type of 
flavor to Clark Kent uh, that George Reeves, George Reeves, <laughs> George Reeves never did put out for Clark Kent. He never did put it out for him. He, you know, so I think it really helped a lot because you know you think about it. You you watch the Superman television series with George Reeves portraying Clark Kent and then when he goes into his Superman persona and there's no difference intelligence rise there's no difference like almost like the only way he disguised himself was in a business suit and glasses he didn't act like someone completely different you know whereas for the movies christopher reeve knew that in order to make it a believable disguise even though it was just the character role he knew that there had to be that difference to be more convincing to people around him in the movie you know so that nobody was aware of who he really was so I, I really appreciate that. I can greatly appreciate that. That's something that George Reeves failed to do. Um, he thought that part one and part two was very good. Part two happened to have been his favorite. But when it got to part three, uh, the movie rights had been sold off to somebody else. And those other people were known for doing low budget films and so you know as he put it Superman 3 ended up being more of a Richard Pryor comedy movie than a real Superman movie and I agree I mean okay it was fine that Richard Pryor was put into it but really with all the comedic action in there it really didn't make it a serious film and uh, to me now he said he thought that the best part of the movie was when his alter ego the dark superman fought against clark kent in the junkyard for me i think the best role was when he had to go against the mega machine in the cave that's when I thought the best was. I thought it was even right down cheesy when they added the small little promo of the new Superman video game with Lex Luthor shooting him down or whoever his character was. I don't think it was actually Lex Luthor. I think it was another villain. But nonetheless, he was using the... Uh, the <laughs> The video game to try to shoot down Superman and I thought that was absolutely cheesy that was just so you know like they was trying to throw in the promo for that Superman video game and was using it on Superman 3 lame lame now he didn't like uh, for the crest for peace because he thought that it was also cheesy personally I thought it was a lot better than three but I have to agree with him one and two is absolutely great two is very very great I guess because uh, you know Lois Lane finally discovers who he is but you know for Superman one it's good because it does do the backstory of how kal -El came to earth and what happened happened to his his planet krypton you know so it, it's good too but um it happened that christopher reeves two kids got a playing role on chapter four the crest for peace um, not to give any spoiler, but um, the villain, the the um, one that he really had to fight against, had created a tornado, 
and a little girl was caught up in it and Superman had to rescue her. That was his daughter. And he returned the, do the, the little girl to her brother, which was his son. So I'm going to have to watch Superman 4 again so I can watch that scene and pay closer attention to his two kids. The reviews, like from Newsweek, Christopher Reeve's entire performance is a delight. Ridiculously good looking, with a face as sharp and strong as an axe blade. His blumbling, fumbling Clark Kent and omnipotent Superman are simply two styles of gallantry and innocence. And from Starlog, Christopher Reeve has become an instant international star on the basis of his first major movie role, that of Clark Kent Superman. Film reviewers, regardless of their opinion of the film, have been almost unanimous in their praise of Reeve's dual portrayal. He is utterly convincing as he switches back and forth between persona. And that is so true. That's what I was just saying. He was able to switch that character role. It's just, he's good. And he won the BAFTA Film Award for Most Promising Newcomer to Leading Film Roles. He, um... Okay, now, kind of get ahead of the car, I guess you could say. We'll go on ahead and, and jump to the main thing, okay? Um, so, before we get there, um, he had played in, in uh, he was a guest in two individual episodes of Smallville. Now, any of you not aware of Smallville, Smallville was played by um his name's on the on the end of my on the end of my tongue anyway so smallville is the television series of it goes it kind of um it just went through the life of Kal-El from the time he came from Krypton and he was adopted by the Kents and it just it, it's a tv series ran quite a ran many uh seasons it just showed his development from being normal human being to discovering his powers as he went along and so um christopher reeve got to be a guest in two episodes and I watched them. I watched both episodes. I haven't watched all of the small, Smallville series, but I had watched almost all of them. So as it happens, um, yeah, we'll go on ahead and get to the main thing about this. Um, Christopher Reeve, and uh, let me double make sure of the year. He had uh, gotten interested Oh, uh, shoot. I don't know how in the world to do this, honestly. Um, I'm not wanting to completely get into it. Not yet. So we'll go back and talk about Smallville. But needless to say, in those two episodes, he describes to kal -El what his true purpose was being there on the earth in those two episodes in the third episode well i guess in the yeah third episode in the third episode his character which he played a dr swan was killed off so we'll get to that point in a moment i'm just not i'm not wanting to get ahead of this so like he played in many other video in many other movies afterward um so let's kind of jump up here and find <sighs> he 
He had a chance to play in Pretty Woman, but he he turned it down. He he was starting. He had a door, uh, auditioned for it, but he he walked out on the audition. They had used a half-hearted casting director to fill in for Julia Roberts, and he got to play in switching channels. And uh, his first two children was through one woman, which I don't think they'd actually got married, but the second time he had met uh, Dana Morrissini, and he married her. They married in 1992. It happened that he had gotten his pilot's license, so he was an aviator. I guess a lot of actors are aviators. John Travolta is an aviator. He's got a pilot's license. He can fly, too, which I think is cool. Um, he played in The Rose and the Jackal. He played Immortal Sins, Picket Fences, he was actually asked if he would want to start his own television series and he turned it down because then he would have been apart from his two other children. He wanted to stay close to them. He got to play in Village of the Dam. He played in one movie called Above Suspicion. Suspicion. He played as a paralyzed police officer. And so he'd done research at a, rehab, at a rehab hospital, and he learned how to use a wheelchair so that he could get in and out of the cars. Um, he was offered the lead in Kidnapped, which was to be shot in Ireland. And and he had decided that he was going to get into riding horseback and so he took lessons and he had bought himself a 12 year old uh, thoroughbred I think it read um, thoroughbred yes the thoroughbred's name was Eastern Express they nicknamed the horse buck um, he had done this while he was in the village of the dam and um, he trained with Buck in 94 and planned to do training level events in 95 and move up to preliminary in 96. The Reef had originally signed up to compete in an event in Vermont. His coach invited him to go to the Commonwealth Dressage and combined training association finals at the Commonwealth Park Equestrian Center in Culpeper, Virginia. So, uh, he finished in fourth place out of 27 in the dressage before rocking his cross-country cross, his cross course. Now, he had, he had looked at all of the different jumps and he was concerned about two of them, but there was one in particular that he really didn't pay no mind to. And uh, so, this happened in May. It was May 27th on nine, in 95. As he was running the course in the competition, the wren buck came to number three jump which was a three by three jump shaped like a W. Buck stopped and refused. And the momentum caused Christopher to fall forward and he held on to the rain and his hands got tangled up in the rain and the momentum caught where his hands was caught up in the reins caused the bridle and bit come off of the horse's head and when he landed he landed head first 
shattered his um it shattered his first and second vertebrae it uh, paralyzed him from the neck down and it also prohibited his breathing so they had to do an emergency trach on him to get him to breathe and they rushed him to the hospital and they took him to the Virginia Medical Center and he had no no recollection of the accident afterwards but because of the accident he get he didn't get to do kidnapped and so somebody else Al, Alan Breck Stewart took his place or no uh, Armand Asante took his place and kidnapped during the recovery, uh, uh, for the first few days after the accident, he was suffering from delirium, and he, he kept mumbling to Dana, like, get the gun, they're after us. Um, Finally, after five days, he regained full consciousness, and um, his doctor explained to him that um, his vertebrae was destroyed in his neck, and um, his his skull and his spine was it attached? It completely crushed the vertebrae, so. His neck had no connection in there. And um, as it also happened, his lungs kept filling up with fluids. And so um, they, they were having to suction the fluids out through his throat. And that was very painful to him when he had realized that he was never going to be able to walk or even ever move any body part he had considered about going on ahead and dying and he had told Dana that maybe it would just be good to go on ahead and let him go and she told him that even though he was injured he was still himself and that she loved him and that she was going to be there for him no matter what he decided if he decided to go on ahead and die or it decided to live that he, she was going to be there with him and after that he decided he wasn't going to die no more he, he decided he was just going to push through so when he was finally able enough um, they done surgery on him. Before Christopher's uh, surgery for his neck, uh, there was one doctor who came in, and uh, and in a foreign accent said that he was there to do a rectum exam on Christopher. It was Robin Williams. He had come in to cheer Christopher up. And he actually got Christopher to laugh. That's just how good of a friend Robin Williams was to Christopher. And they'd done some procedures to try to reconnect the nerves and stuff. And they used a bit of his pelvis bone to build up bone in the neck for the vertebrae and um, he had to use a respirator for the rest of his life he had to have it he couldn't breathe through his mouth and nose he had to use a trach ventilator for the rest of his life and um, through all that, 
he decided that he was going to push for research on using spinal fluid and, um, you know, like the embryo spinal fluid, right, like from a baby, and, you know, for a uh, cell stem. That's it, cell stem. He pushed to do research with cell stem and, and uh, helping crippled people to be able to walk and stuff. He had even got to help coach uh, uh, the Special Olympics for the for the disabled in one year. Anyway, um, he went to Israel, and Israel had a more advanced study on using STEM cell stem and stuff for the paralyzed and so he worked with them and they worked with him and he was very um, impressed with Israel's progress with how advanced they were with it and he had wished that the United States had a program similar. So when he came back to the United States, he worked hard to have something similar like that. And that's when they created the Christopher Reeve Foundation. Um, he created the Christopher Reeve Foundation, which is now the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. And that was to speed up research. And uh, the words they through their foundation, they was receiving funds and grants to be able to push what was needed for the research and stuff. After the accident, like as I was saying, he played a couple roles in Smallville. Now when he was in Smallville, he was already paralyzed. So Dr. Swan was a quadriplegic that was telling Kal-El his purpose and um, as it happens in the third episode when they killed him off when they killed Dr. Swan off is when Christopher Reeve died before he died it had gotten to the point that he was able to feel hot and cold on his body he was able to move his limbs to an extent. And when he first started really showing signs of recovery, he was able to move his index finger a little. He um, worked out as hard as possible on the equipment that was made for him so that And by any chance that he would be able to walk again, his body would be able to support him. He had, um, there was one time that, uh, this, this is so hard for me, guys. This is, this is just so hard for me. Tom Relling. Tom Relling was kal -El. In Smallville. Anyway, uh, he had been given one kind of a drug called Cygen, which was supposed to reduce damage to the spinal cord, but it caused him to go into anaphylactic shock and his heart had stopped. He said that he had had an out of body experience and he remembered saying, I'm sorry, but I have to go now during the event. He had actually made an autobiography, and he wrote, and then I left my body. I was up on the ceiling. I looked down and saw my body stretched out on the bed, not moving. All, everybody, there was 15 or 20 people, the doctors, EMTs, the nurses, was working on me. The noise and the commotion grew quieter as though someone were gradually turning down the volume. After receiving a large dose of epinephrine, he woke up and stabilized later that night. 
he had survived between 2002 or in 2002 and then again in 2004 he had survived several serious infections that had they believed had originated from his bone marrow. He recovered from three that actually could have been fatal. In October of 2004, now I remember this so plainly, my first husband had to go in to have a stent placed He um, from, for kidney stones. And um, while I was reading in his cubicle, while he was gone off to go get that procedure done, I was reading in the cubicle. And they had the television on and the news came up and they said that Christopher Reeve had died. He had developed a bed sore, an ulcer, a bed ulcer, and it had turned septus, sepsis. And uh, they gave him an antibiotic for the infection. The next day, I think it says the 4th, on the 9th, on the 4th he spoke at the Rehab, Rehab Institute of Chicago on behalf of the Institute's work. And it was the last time that they had ever seen him publicly. On the 9th, he felt okay and he went to go watch his son's hockey game. But later that night, he went into cardiac arrest and went into a coma. This was after receiving the antibiotic for that infection. He was taken to the Westchester Hospital in Mount Kisco, New York, 18 hours later. On the 10th, he passed away. But I do, I remember that day so well watching that news. And I broke down crying right there in the hospital while waiting for my husband to come out. I broke down crying. I had always admired Christopher Reeve. I loved his blue eyes and his acting. He was so good. He made me like Superman. Any other Superman I don't like, but I like his Superman. And I have watched a few of his other movies. Another one of my favorites of his is Somewhere in Time. A beautiful, beautiful love movie with Jane Seymour. The other night I found they had listed about Aviator. As I had said, he had gotten his pilot license, and uh, he had gotten a chance to play in a movie called The Aviator. Now, they didn't know that he could drive, that he could fly a Sturman plane. And so they was very delighted, and it happened that the plane that he had to fly in the movie was a Sturman. A bi it was a bi-ring plane. And um, he'd done his own stunts. And I found it for free online. And I watched it. And it's a very good movie. It's a 1985 movie. Please do not mistake that for the 2014 whatever year it was with Leo DiCaprio. Leo DiCaprio. Uh, it's not about the same person. I promise. They are two different movies altogether. Leonardo played a completely different character in his aviator 
from what Christopher Reeve did in his in 1985. So if you're a Christopher Reeve fan, please search up The Aviator from 1985. You can watch it for free on TIVO, TVO, T TIVO or whatever. Anyway, you can download TIVO's app. The movie is free on there. And that's where I watched it. It's very good. It's a very good movie. Anyway, about the hair, where it would come out in, in pieces. The one thing I couldn't understand was how that having a spine injury could cause somebody to go bald. And he had finally just completely gone bald. Come find out because he had the problem of the hair coming out. He decided in the end to just shave his head. I thought it had something to do with the spine injury and I just couldn't figure that out but no. It was just a condition in his scalp that he couldn't, he always lost his hair so. I remember watching a short documentary of his attempting recovery and it showed him they took him to a pole and they lowered him down and with two trainers beside him he got to move his legs in the water showed him in bed and he was trying so hard to raise his arm. He got his arm up, his hand, about a half inch and then he moved his index finger up a little higher. He was trying so hard. He was a fighter. years later Dana his wife was discovered that she lung had lung cancer and she passed away so his surviving children have took over the foundation and they're still doing research and because of because of Christopher there's been a lot of people who has started to recover from spinal injuries using robotic legs and stuff learning how to walk all over again because of him I'm sorry Anyway, um, I still miss him. And to me, he was the best actor. There's only one other actor that I admire just as greatly, and that's Hugh Jackman. There's many other actors and actresses that I like. But Christopher Reeve was my favorite. And then you, Jackman, he's my second favorite. And I'm still yet to watch all the movies that Christopher Reeve ever played in. I haven't watched all of them yet. I've only watched a few of them.
anyway guys I told you the other day on my video that this one was going to be tough for me I remember uh, I hadn't been married to my first husband very long a few years we was married in 91 it happened in 95 anyway um, we was visiting mom and she told me that he had been in an accident on a horse uh, I don't remember if she told me that the horse trampled on him or what. She might not have even said that, but if anybody thinks that the horse trampled on him, the horse didn't. He just fell head first because the, the bridle came off the horse's head. So he landed head first. The horse didn't trample him. So, but, um, yeah, I remember when mom told me that. it was hard for me to believe that anyway guys I hope that you enjoyed this video as I said earlier you will be seeing me tomorrow with another journey vlog and when I get another historical story studied up I'll give you another video anyway guys have a great night